I acknowledge all those um, Murray nations um, around this country and um, yeah, pay uh, tribute to their um, past fighters and uh, those who are living who continue on with this struggle against colonialism. And of course, I uh, look forward to the young ones who are coming forward um, behind us to maintain this struggle. Um, I do despair for some of them because, um, you know, there's a system they call education. I call it enculturation. I don't call it education because you're being inculcated with all this education system that's just one way. It's centered in one direction and that is um, white way or no way. And um, so I, I don't particularly like, um, you know, the way education systems are operating. Um, not for us anyway, as Aboriginal people, because, you know, here in Australia, you have a system um, that just deals with um, white colonialism, former um, uh, British feces who came here uh, in the past and <clears throat> as thieves, and they continue to ma uh, maintain those practices of being thieves. Um, but anyway, um, that's that's my fight to uh, to continue on with. Um, the topics I understand this morning is self determination and um, and land rights. And what was the other one? There was a there was a third. Oh, a reconciliation. Okay. Um, so let me start with reconciliation. Um, I had a meeting with who, uh, with uh, David Hurley who's now the Governor-General of Australia, but I met with him at Government House in Sydney um, one year prior to him becoming the Governor-General of Australia. The reason I had a meeting with uh, David Hurley was to, um, um, as the Governor of New South Wales, was to discuss uh, the fact that um, in 1948, out here on the, um, where I am, a hundred and, um, about a hundred and, yeah, uh, 10 k's away from here, um, there's a lot of um, um, skeletal remains <clears throat> that have been trampled over by cattle and sheep. Um, we don't know exactly how many people were killed there, but uh, it was a massacre in 1848. And uh, my ancestry goes back there to connect to that place um, through the skin group called Murugu Bibble, which is my, um, a lady called Granny Ellen and uh, she survived that massacre when she, we worked out from my grandmother talking to her and my mother who grew up with her and she died when, she, when my mother was nine. Uh, but we worked out from those discussions that they relayed to me that she was about um, seven or eight when uh, the massacre occurred and she died, my, that old woman died in 19, um, what was it, 19, um, 1930, uh, 1930, 39. She died in 1939. Um, so we, we, um, uh, yeah, we, we argue that um, she was about 100 to 102, between that and ages, 100 to 102 years old when she died. Um, but now I, I spoke to David Hurley and I said to him, you know, you, you guys are promoting these things called reconciliation. I said, quite honestly, my people cannot um, negotiate anything with you until you acknowledge killing our people. And uh, what we want you to do is to assist us to bury our dead. Uh, because I don't know whether you've, um, any of you know about the story of Antigone, um, but um, this, is a, this is a worst type of crime or punishment that you could ever commit on anybody, and that is to kill someone and just leave them to rot and let the birds and the animals pick their bones, uh, pick their flesh from their bones. Um, and that's what happened with those people down there. Now we didn't, you know, those people didn't commit any crimes. Um, they were just simply there. And the documents that I've read where an interview was um, um, done between the fellow who um, organized that, um, when they interviewed him, they interviewed him and asked him and uh, he said, they asked him about any um, any um, uh, regrets that he had when he colonised the area and squatted in the area. His response basically was, "Yes, my I I organised to kill the people." Um, and when they asked him why, his response was, "Well, you know, they kept I, I got sick of seeing spears sticking out of my cattle and sheep, and so what I 
Um, he said, I asked them to leave, but they wouldn't leave. Now, how in the world can you expect that people who have lived on country for thousands of years and then some white fella comes along and squat on it, on your land, and then puts some foreign animals there, um, and then all of a sudden they say, oh, can you, can you not hang around here anymore, you mob? Can you move somewhere else? Well, we don't work like that. <clears throat> That's not how it works. And I explained that to David Hurley, and I said, until you help us bury our dead, there's no way in the world we can re reconcile anything with you, yeah? And we will reject any offers of reconciliation from your part. It's not going to work. And um, and so uh, he he got uh, the the message, and even to the point where he said he was going to take it back to the New South Wales government and ask him and the military to um, assist in bringing their machines to find the human bones and human remains, so that we can then um, have a formal burial uh, for the people. Now there were there were. Uh, people from four different tribes there. There was Murawari, Guamu, uh, Guma, um, Nimbar and Ualiai. Um, they were the people who were present and the, uh, the families who were there who were killed from those four groups. Um, and it happened during a time of ceremony. So reconciliation um, on the surface, uh, on the face of it, does not mean absolutely, well it means jack shit to me, quite frankly, pardon the French. Uh, for those Christians amongst you. Um, and so I, I, I can't see how we can reconcile until those things are, are um, settled uh, for us. Um, now, then that takes us then to the uh, question of squatter and the uh, land theft. One thing that I've been doing um, in recent days, I'm organizing, a, um, I'm now involved in preparing a court case in Western Australia. Um, on a native title matter to, to rescind some aspects of a native title. Um, I'm not a practicing lawyer anymore, but I have a legal background. Um, and um, now I'm just acting as a consultant. And so I'm working on looking at how to overturn some um, aspects of native title determinations, even though I'm involved in one with my own mob. Um, and um, I'm also preparing a case uh, now to defend ourselves against the um, um, government institution wanting to take back land that they purchased and granted to traditional owners and now they want to re remove the traditional owners from the lands and give it to someone else. Um, but this is an absolutely crazy situation but um, such is uh, the Australian government. Now, I'm directly involved in that, and I'm the leader of the Uwalia Nation, and I'm recognised as such by Queen Elizabeth II, who writes to me as Gila Head of State of the Uwalia Nation, or leader of the Uwalia Nation. Um, and uh, the New South Wales government, including um, Commonwealth government officials, government um, ministers, they write to me as Gila Head of State or leader of the Uwalia Nation. So I am a recognised leader um, within the legal system, and the British framework um, in regards to my people. That cre creates some very legal anomalies around um, the status quo here in Australia um, because they have to deal with me accordingly now. Um, and so the fight, I think, is to sort of say and take away this whole thing about me living on country where the land was purchased for my, my mob and I'm living on that country. So the application is to evict me uh, and my wife from the lands and my family from the lands, uh, which is traditionally our lands anyway. Um, so, so that's it's an interesting fight. I'm 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 happy with this fight because um, I reckon it'll get all the way to the to the high court. And this is a, this all evolves around the question of land rights and um, and so what are those land rights? So now I've I've established a and and and, and put in a cross claim against the government. And uh, my cross-claim is into their common law system to say, hang on a minute, um, you guys never ever got the land off us. Um, um, all my research for this court case clearly demonstrates, and you know, I have some dear friends who are very much involved in this with me, and they're all uh, they're professors of law and, um, and um, have some you know, really understanding of the British system and the way British do things. I've, um, I, I have um, been talking with them and, and uh, you, we, we've, we've, we've done some 
or they have, um, following what I've been doing all these years, have written some wonderful um, um, essays in law journals around the country, which are all you know peer reviewed and published all over the world in these uh, uh, law journals. And so the the judges have to take notice to them, no matter where you are, and law faculties have to take notice of them as authority pieces of work. Um, and so what we have here now is that we, I'm arguing on the basis that uh, the British never ever got our land because they, the, the British Crown never occupied this land. Um, and so by virtue of the fact that they've never actually possessed the land, the British only have what they call a registered title. And so this registered title system uh, to the land tenure, uh, it's not actual possessory title. Um, it's a registered title and, um, and it's just, uh, as, as my friends call it, a mere colour of title in Australia. And, um, and so land rights for us is, is, an, is um, a question that's still sitting up, and up in the air at present and it's sitting there in that little thing called iCloud that we all refer to now. And um, someone has to work out how this is going to work. Um, I'm try I will certainly be um, fleshing this out um, within this court case. And so native title is a bit of a misdemeanor, uh, misnomer because, um, uh, uh, and it's a misnomer because of um, a couple of things. Um, when we looked at native title and we look at the, um, the determinations that are made around this country, um, the, the issue that we have is the fact that when, they, when the determination is made, even when a consent determination is made, that is the government agreeing not to argue the matter, litigate the matter in the court, but we just have an agreement, um, it, come, it turns out that um, under the Native Title Act, there is no title uh, for Aboriginal people. Um, uh, Aboriginal people's title um, is just simply that. It's called native title. Native title does not give you um, a land title on the land registry. When you look at the uh, exclusive possession of lands the, for Aboriginal people around this country, those lands are classified on the state land registry as unused state land. It's not in the name of any Aboriginal group or tribe or clan or family names or anything like that. It is not registered as um, an Aboriginal land title. It's registered as unused state land. Now, what, when I look at that, I, I go back to um, the old mission days. And so in, when we look at the old mission days, all the land that was set aside for Aboriginal people was land reserved for the use of Aborigines only. That's what its title was. <coughs> now, <coughs> what we've got is that we've gone all these years from 1969 and they took away the missions and uh, then 1983 they took away all the land and validate all the taking of those lands that were formerly Aboriginal reserves. Um, and then we get native title, go through a high court case, win the, fa win the fact that we still have proprietary interest in the land in this country under our law and custom, but then the title goes back to what we had pre Marbo, pre-1969, when, um, when we were all living on uh, Aboriginal reserves, land set aside for the use of Aborigines only. And that's what native title is giving to Aboriginal people right around this country. The land itself has no value, no economic value whatsoever, right? And uh, Aboriginal people can... Um, or the other difficulty is that the Aboriginal people don't own the minerals because they've reserved this stuff and uh, oils and gases and water. They've reserved that to the Crown. And so um, this is a, um, a case that has to yet be uh, um, fought out in the system um, to determine who owns that land. Now, um, the irony is that um, I'm involved in my people's native title claim in Queensland because I uh, supported them in doing that. And we, um, the native title determination is going to be handed down and we're the first and only Aboriginal group 
uh, in Australia where the state government has now recognised and will in this determination recognise our allodial title to the land. That means all the airspace above us is ours and all the all, whatever is underneath our, our feet to the centre of the earth is ours as well. The Crown has uh, relinquished any claims that they have to any minerals that sits under those lands and uh, gases and oil. Now we're the only, as I say, we're the only um, First Nation group in Australia where that's now been achieved. Um, and we're, we're going after a lot of compensation as well. Um, so that's, that's important. Now our next step from land um, then is to become self-governing and I've, I've been calling meetings all over this country Oh, sorry, in, on my country, uh, for quite some time now, and we're bringing people back, young and um, older people, to be back on country so we can talk about going forward and how we're going to become self-governing within our own right and uh, become self-determining. And so we're in that process now of, of really starting to, um, to work out a, a governance system that suits us. Our old way of governance, of course, is that the, you know, when we have ceremony, then we all sit together and um, um, females and doing their thing, males doing their thing, and then they all reach an agreement between the different clans and between the different tribes. So we have this interrelated, uh, inter and intra um, and, um, relationship with other, with other peoples, and uh, we're sort of setting up a governance system so that it can be articulated for the white, white world, because right now everybody's totally confused because they they don't know the societal norms and structures of Aboriginal society so trying to put a put a, um, a Western style governance system in place for us just doesn't work and um, and it doesn't work when you begin to talk about a community because I my my dad's people and I grew up and educated in Walgan um, in northern New South Wales not far away from me and um, one one of the uh, the difficulties I always sort of express to government people is that when you're talking about a, a single Aboriginal community, even in Walgan, you have five Aboriginal communities, not one Aboriginal community. Those the people who are there are not not a not a uh, an homogenous group of people because they have they come from different mobs, they come from different places. They were brought there during the old welfare days, and the government were bringing us and. and putting us um, all onto missions and creating this, you know, this, this <laughs> aggregation, I guess, of, of people um, onto a, a particular area of land. And so uh, when, we say, when we talk about governance, we're talking about a Western system to involve a, um, a community. Now that community does not work together. It, it, and, um, yeah, there's a lot of efforts, but a lot of people say, no, nah, we're not going to get up, get mixed up with that mob. So you end up with a family and their alliances um, running an organisation in a town. Then they'll have another organisation that'll emerge, and that's run by another Aboriginal family group. Um, and so it's not as simple as living in a Western society. Um, and so we have very different ways of doing things, and that's right now. And that's some of the frustration... Um, that, is, that, that come through when we start talking about um, governance and, um, and um, uh, management, self-management or self-determination. Um, the only other thing around all of that is the fact that um, what frustrates a lot of people out in the bush out here is A, they don't understand the education system of the white man, they don't understand the white man's um, system of governance, we don't engage in that in that process, and we're not participating in that in that uh, process. Um, we sit there, you know, like uh, like a branch on a tree, and so there's only this one branch that sits out there, and it's got all these little leaves on it, which is all the black fellas sitting out there, and then over here, the whole tree that grows um, is growing and growing, and we just sit out there on that one limb, and so there's a lot of things that have to be taken into account here. Um, when you start talking about governance because you have to revisit how we did it in the first place. Um, without that, you, you're just flogging a dead horse and um, you're not going to achieve much. Um, so, yeah, 
self-determination um, has a long way to go. We have a lot to, lot to do, um, but we have to work out. Um, when we talk about self-determination, we have to think about two things. And those two things are, which way do we run it? Do we run it blackful away or do we run it whiteful away? And then when we work out that, then we have to look at the mechanics that operate all of that and how will that work and um, how, how does the decision making work and how do we facilitate that within the Western governance system so that we can negotiate and make sense. Now, the problem, of course, is that um, government officials have no, no interaction like they should in terms of negotiating these things with us. Um, and so they sit in Canberra and get their, um, get their Aboriginal consultants who they prefer uh, to talk to them about ways forward. But those Aboriginal people have lost their connection and don't have very much relationship or a close relationship with the people with whom they uh, about whom they're planning uh, all these things. So, yeah, we, we have a long way to go um, in sorting things out. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, we're working off a system where people just have these assumptions that they know best for Aboriginal people. And we are very different from each other. Um, we got more languages and more groups in this country than they have um, in difference in racial um, ethnicity and late linguistically in Europe. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty difficult to, to sort of uh, work with multiple languages and numbers uh, and try and make it into one policy in this country, which is what the Australians are trying to do. Not going to work. So anyway, um, I'll leave it open to questions now for you. And we'll... Um, Go from there. If anything that I've said you want me to expand on, please um, ask. What a wonderful world. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's nice to that's nice to hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow, that's that's yeah, that's another story uh, there. Let's leave that one park that for the time being. <laughs> but that's wonderful. That that is really wonderful. I hope you're coming down on the uh, 26th of January to Canberra um, because we, we're sort of the 50th anniversary. We want you all down there if that's possible, yeah. Um, just on, on that point, um, yeah, looking at self-determination um, from a self-governance -govern point of view and looking at the decolonisation uh, from Britain, um, in 1982 myself, I, I went with Ozzy Cruz and uh, Gough Whitlam, the former Prime Minister. We travelled to uh, f uh, five African nation states and had meeting, formal meetings with their heads of state and um, uh, government officials about how they decolonised um, from Britain. And, um, and it, was, it was very enlightening to look at how it is. Most of them, unfortunately, you know, shed a lot of bloodshed and the loss of life was quite enormous on both sides. Um, <clears throat> um, but nonetheless, that was their commitment to decolonization and freeing themselves from, you know, from these colonial states. Um, there, there are people still trying to free themselves from the colonial mentality around this world even to, uh, as we speak. And, you know, we're a classic example of that. Um, my reference to Scotland with you was the fact that um, Australia is in a bit of bother um, because once Scotland goes and if Scotland, the Scottish people vote to become independent from Britain, then the Australian constitution then no longer stand as a legal document. Um, now, there's a lot of contention about the Australian constitution as to whether or not it was actually went through the parliament in England. Um, so we're we're still looking at that, and the because there, there's a lot of um, a lot of high-ranking people say that the Australian um, uh, Constitution was only established by a letters patent, and um, the, so that would have made it Queen Victoria at the time, but Queen Victoria we are informed um, did not sign or or issue any letters patent or orders in council establishing the Australian Constitution. 
So there are a, a, a number of significant issues around that very point. And of course, you know, everybody studying law and politics these days uh, all sort of talk about uh, the Australia Act in 1986, which um, Michael Lavage, Senator Gareth Evans and uh, Bob Hawke went across and negotiated with England. And that, that uh, document only relates to the fact that we no longer, uh, there, there's no appeal process from Australian High Court to the Privy Council in, in England. Um, it also took away the fact that the Parliament of Britain could no longer make laws for, uh, for Australia. And it also took away, uh, it also established um, uh, the, the fact that the Australian parliaments, both state and federal, could pass laws that may be repugnant to the English constitution and English laws. And uh, it also established a process where the Australian courts could establish their own precedents without having to be dominated and having to contr be controlled by English precedents in law. Um, so they're the only things that, that, that it altered. Um, and of course, it, um, it also reinforced um, the recognition that, the, that Queen of England, the sovereignty, uh, the sovereign monarch of England, still owns this country. And uh, that, that's why Queen Elizabeth came to Australia in 1986 and signed um, documents in every state and the Commonwealth. So she had to go to every state to sign this agreement in every state, which made her the queen of each of the states and the Commonwealth of Australia. Um, now, without that, well, then Australia does not have any validity as a nation state in the international community. Australia operates under the sovereignty uh, of the Queen of England, uh, the Crown of England. So Australia does not have its own sovereignty. It's a sovereign state governed and controlled by the Crown in England. Um, you guys just elect dumb, par dumb people to Parliament and, and uh, they run around thinking they're all mighty and unfortunately look where we're at. You know, you've got this crazy situation where we're living in a police state. You don't even know it, yeah? Because they've exercised the uh, biosecurity law um, which is martial law upon the, upon the states. Every person in this country is subject to martial law now. That's why you have military running around with police, because they're falsifying uh, the true nature of, um, of these lockdowns because we're under martial law. And um, martial law, they can do anything to you, whether you like it or not. Um, because it, uh, martial law takes away government procedure and government control. Martial law puts all the decision into the hands of one person, and that's the Governor-General of Australia. And that person talks with the Executive Government of Australia and all the, all the state governors and premiers, and it's being controlled by one person. So, yeah, um, think about that for a moment, because that's what you're living under right now. Anyway, that's how, how it works. On, 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 um, on the issue of, um, um, what do they call it, the, um, the Constitution of Australia, once Scotland goes, then Australia's Constitution again loses any authority because, you see, it's quoted in there that it's um, Scotland, uh, in, uh, Britain, Scotland, Ireland and, Wa and Wales. Now, because Scot uh, Wales has gone, and Ireland is gone, um, then you have a situation which gives, which establishes that Australia now is part of Scotland and Britain. And um, so once Scotland goes, then we're only attached to Britain. And so we have to rewrite, uh, our constitution has to be, uh, uh, have uh, taken out of it by ordering council or by letters patent uh, take the name Scotland out of it, so that just leaves us in England, and so uh, Britain. So that's a, that raises some serious legal questions around that, about self-governance within this country. In the meantime, us as Aboriginal people, the First Nations peoples, we have to work out where we sit in all of this, and of course um, all that mess up that's going on about reconciliation and about voice to Parliament 
that's a fur thing. That's that's very clever. Uh, it's a very clever manipulating mind to focus our attention on something that's really that's not real. All a lot of the reconciliation stuff, right up to the Uluru statement over those years. I, I'm um, I think we've calculated that the mining companies in the Australian government contributed eight hundred million dollars in that period. Um, leading up to that document um, coming out. Now, um, the unfortunate thing about uh, that document, about what happened in Uluru, right, they went around doing regional consultations and from these regional areas in Australia, um, the community, the people who attended these regional meetings, um, they then put up their hands and selected, I think, eight or ten people um, from that region to go to Uluru and, and, and speak. Now, all of this was being organised by land council people, um, uh, different organisations, Commonwealth government institutions, um, and uh, people who were running organisations. So they brought them in to coordinate these regional meetings and paid for them. Now, so they elected all of these people from the grassroots to get out there to go to Uluru. When they got to Uluru, um, the, the organisers of the Uluru um, conference or get-together um, decided, and I don't know how they did this, but decided that the people who were organising all of the meetings around the country had a right to speak as well and, and have an input into it when in fact previously they were only facilitating to get the grassroots mind there to that meeting so we can listen to grassroots voices. Now, so I turn up there and um, um, I turned up as an independent at my own cost with other people and, um, and we, were, we were basically observers, that was fine. But when we... When we realised what was going on there, you got into this meeting and so these people who had organised and facilitated the meetings to bring these people together, they controlled the meeting, every aspect of the meeting that took place at the gathering in Uluru, at Uluru. And so the people who were from the grassroots did not have a proper voice. They did not speak. They, ref they wouldn't let them talk. They kept suppressing them and everybody kept putting their hand up and saying, yeah, 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 we want to talk. No, 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 you... And, and honestly, the people's voices were gagged. They never said a damn thing. And so these bureaucrats who were running these meetings just controlled everything. And, and that's what frustrated all the people, uh, the grassroots people who went, who were elected to go there. And, um, and so that's why there was this massive division within that conference and the people just walked out because they were, they, they, their voices were not being heard. They were completely ignored and they were stifled. And, um, and so the bureaucrats just controlled the whole proceedings. And then when they were going, they were supposed to be working on, you know, different terms for a statement um, to be made and so that this communique would come out from this gathering. But, you see, the communique was being written by the bureaucrats and the people who were controlling that, writing of that, was Noel Pearson. Um, um, and behind the scenes, there was a little man uh, sitting up in the room in the motel without showing his face. His name was Lieberman, from the Lieberman Legal Company down in Melbourne. And this man is, you know, um, I don't mind saying it, he's a Zionist, you know, and he... And he makes a lot of money, uh, contributions to um, Israel, to the housing developments that's taking place on, um, on Palestinian lands. And so this man was one of the lead authors and writers of this um, um, document. And, and not only that, he was also co-chair of the reconciliation um, body. Um, that was pushing this agenda. And so we had enormous difficulties with all of that. And, and, and the fact that this document got written without those grassroots persons sitting in any workshops 
to come up with the terms of reference made a mockery out of the whole, whole thing. And that's why the people just rejected it and said, no way in the world. Um, sounded good, but the mechanics and how it worked doesn't work for us. And the fact that we haven't had the grassroots input into it as we wanted to, as we thought we were going to uh, have, um, then that whole thing fell apart. And so you've got now the grassroots, you're saying, oh, that's bullshit. That was all pre-written, you know. And if you look at the people who signed that document, they're all public servants. Have a look at that document. Have a look at that big thing inside the frame where the signatures are. You look at all of those people, we can guarantee you that 99.9% um, .9 of them are public servants who controlled that meeting. And so the grassroots voice left out. Now, on this whole question of voice to parliament, we had that back in 19... Um, I sat on a committee in 1973, um, at, towards the end of 1973. I was commissioned by the, by the government under Gough Whitlam when he became prime minister. And um, I sat on that committee uh, with some very senior um, black people from around the country who were recognised as the leaders, um, and they were grassroots people. And we pulled them together and we established an, an elected uh, body of people called the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee. You should be able to go to the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Island Studies to get information on that. And uh, so that National Aboriginal, uh, National Aboriginal Consultative Committee was the voice directly to Parliament. We spoke directly to, and I say we because I ended up working with them and advising them um, as an outsider later, um, but they were directly talking uh, to government on policies and issues in Aboriginal affairs, and a lot of which was around land rights, a lot of it was around housing, a lot of it was around securing um, uh, securing legal services and medical services for our people as well. And also getting into industrial relations and, and setting up uh, depart, you know, setting up employment and education and employment training programs, vocational training program for our people. Now, all of that, um, then within that organisation, uh, a faction emerged. And I must say it was a woman who created the faction, right? And I'll, I'll drop her name. Her name was Loa Jo O'Donnell created a massive faction within the organisation. And that lady helped break down that organisation. And she worked with a man called Nugget Coombs, who was a, one of the most senior um, public servants in this country. And he was the advise, senior advisor to seven successive prime ministers. That's how influential this man was. And um, I, I, I would suggest that you might look this man up. He's called, his name is Herbert C. Coombs, and um, uh, he was the f governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, and then he became a, v a bigwig in the establishment of an Aboriginal department in Canberra. Now, the, um, the thing about this man and the role he played was to bring everything together and to make things happen for Aboriginal people. When you look at who this man was, he was a man who was put in charge of the post-war reconstruction period after the Second World War. And the whole societal structure that we have right now in education, universities, banking, the whole lot, and commerce and trade around the world, this man is the bloke who created the modern Australian society. Um, that's how influential he was. He, and and I, I worked with him. He was a brilliant man. He had a brilliant mind. Um, and unfortunately, um, he wanted to make it easy for Aboriginal people, so he selected the leadership that he wanted to deal with, and they were the ones that he, he, he trained, he educated, and they're the ones who are still now controlling Aboriginal affairs in this country beyond the scene. And uh, they're very influential. Um, yeah, so... Uh, to, it, 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 that's another long story. It'll take you not, take another five-hour lecture to tell you all about that. Um, but uh, it's important to know, though, that that happened. Then we had several um, elected bodies up to 1985, um, and uh, in 19, 1979, 
um, Ellie Gilbert's husband and a group of men who were protesting on Capitol Hill to try and stop them from building the, the Parliament House that exists there now. And they, they said, we will move off here if you guys agree to a treaty with us and we were to negotiate a treaty. And so the you know, Fraser government agreed that they would negotiate a, a national treaty. And of course that came up at the National Aboriginal Conference as it was known then, which was the elected body uh, to advise the government. Um, they took up the, um, the mantle and uh, ran with it. And um, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, I became the, um, um, the director of research to develop the national framework for that treaty. And um, I worked for uh, over four and a half years in putting together a, a, fr a structured framework <coughs> for a treaty. Uh, and then all of a sudden along came Bob Hawke and Bob Hawke decided, oh no, we'll do a treaty, but we'll do it our way. It's not going to be done blackfell away. And so they sacked that, that, uh, that consultative body uh, that was elected by the people to talk to the government about policy issues. So all this thing about, um, you know, electing a voice to parliament, like, you know, um, we had it. Yeah? And those people, and Marcia Langton's included in this, um, and Lao Zedonu, Patrick Dodson, all those people helped bring down those voices to Parliament that were already there. They were elected by the people. Now, all over this country, we had 36 people elected from all over this country. So these people brought them down and they centralised the negotiations into the Federation of Aboriginal Land Council, which they formed with the aid of this fellow called H.C. Coombs. He's now dead, I know we shouldn't be talking about uh, dead people, but anyway, I will in regards to this man. Um, and so the confusion and the mess that we have was is created because they tried to create, they created a dictatorship system in this country and they chose who should be talking for Aboriginal people. And, the, and that is still the case right now. And that's why we have so much confusion and, and conflict within Aboriginal society and within the politics of Aboriginal um, society. So um, <coughs> the big mistake is not recognising, you know, the sovereign independence of each independent nation. And so they should be talking to each independent nation whose language is theirs, their self-determination choices is theirs, and the way they want to develop a, either an integrated approach, assimilation approach, or an independent governance system sitting side by side. That's their choices. And these people are all linguistically different. It's like try, you know, getting our people together, if you haven't noticed, it's like trying to get the French and the Germans and the British to agree to come together as one and make a decision. No, that's not going to bloody happen. They maintain their independence. And this is where Aboriginal people are at at present, and not enough people know of these political dynamics um, and cultural dynamics that exist that prevents us from coming together like that. There's no way in the world. So until we get to understand that and work on that, um, yeah, we're, we're going to be in a mess for a bloody long time. Well, let me just say the Treaty of Watangi in New Zealand um, is, is quite problematic. Um, there's a lot of Maori in New Zealand who say, well, we were not a party to that treaty and we don't agree to it. Um, but the application of that treaty um, is applied across the board, the whole of New Zealand. And um, a lot of the Maoris are not happy with that, but they, they live with it and, um, and do their own negotiations anyway um, under those treaties. So they use the terms of that treaty um, to advance their own position and they work on that even though they're not directly party to the treaty. Um, <coughs> in, <coughs> in relation to Aboriginal people um, here, I've been telling people and I'm really glad that Lydia Thorpe has finally got it and uh, got the message. Um, I've, I've been coaching people to say, you know, the, the state governments in Australia cannot negotiate the type of treaty that we want. The, the state, gov state and territory governments can only negotiate what's written in their constitution, right? 
So if you look at the Constitution of New South Wales, you look at what's in that Constitution, that establishes what powers they have and what they can make laws about, okay? And so they can only deal with those matters. That's the same as Victoria, same as Northern Territory, yeah, all these things. So they're restricted in what they can do. The Commonwealth Government, on the other hand, well, the question is, where do they fit? So do they pass a law then to recognise each of the state treaties if they're going to do it? Because that's about all they can do, because the, state, the Commonwealth Government cannot impose a treaty, or can, if they want, impose a national treaty upon the states. <coughs> That's not going to happen. That is not going to happen. And so, until each of the states agree to the terms of a treaty. Now, the other difficulty about these treaties is this. It's a one-way discussion right now. It's a one-way street, yeah? And it's going into a cul-de-sac where there's no exit at the other end, yeah? And... Uh, what I'm saying here is this, before we can negotiate with anything Aboriginal people with the Crown and negotiate a treaty, we must first understand what the Crown is prepared to give up and concede. Yeah? Now if the Crown is not going to concede anything to us as Aboriginal people, like for example land rights, like for example our right to govern ourselves under our own laws as we develop them, and as we restructure those laws under our old ways, until we have those um, spirit, spirit locations and the spirits that have travelled through our country, unless we're able to, to recognise those and have a law around that and have an agreement around that, well, it's not worth anything. It means nothing. Right? So, so first of all, we have to find out what the Crown is prepared to give up yeah? and concede to us. Now, if they're not, if we, if we don't understand that, what the hell are we negotiating? You know, we're just negotiating a package to live under their system the way they want it. And quite frankly, they don't have the sovereign authority to concede anything to us. Yeah, because it's all owned and it's all in the name of the Crown of England. So we need to first understand what the crown is that's why we went to that's why we did the five nation tour of africa to find out how and what the crown gave up when they negotiated their independence from england at that time yeah and unfortunately we've never had an opportunity to sit down amongst our people and say this is what they did in these other countries when they liberated themselves from England and became decolonised and developed their own self-governance. Now, each of those countries, by the way, agreed that they would have their ambassadors come and talk to the Aboriginal people about how they did it and how they negotiated with England on all the terms that they, that they agreed to in terms of separating themselves from England and restoring the power unto themselves. That's, and then developing that uh, relationship diplomatic relationship going forward. That is what we have to do. Anything else short of that in this country is a waste of time and we're just chopping wood for practice. What I said about Lydia, Lydia did an interview with the BBC um, about a month ago and uh, Lydia just pushed the point at the, AB, at the BBC um, in that interview saying that, um, that Yes, the people, if they're going to enter into a treaty, have to know what the Crown in England is going to give up and concede to the people um, uh, in these negotiations. Now, having said that, um, the Victorian government, when they passed their uh, law in relation to the establishment of a, of a treaty commission, um, Lydia was in the State Parliament at the time and she contacted me and asked me to have a look at the document and, um, you know, the first in the first two paragraphs I said, you've, de you've been defeated already um, because in the, in the first two paragraphs, in the second paragraph, they talk about, oh, um, uh, Victorian Aborigines. I said, so where's your independence? Yeah, you're not. You've already been, uh, been classified by the government in that statute as Victorian Aborigines, yeah? There's no independence, you, you've got nothing. So, yeah, it's, it, it's crazy.
it, it, it's, and, and I said, what you need to do as a commission, you need to get the commission to say to the government, hang on a minute, you have already verbalised <laughs> our, our process where we are not a independent Aborigines, we are Victorian Aborigines. Duh, how do, you, how do you work from that? How do you develop an, a, any type of structure around negotiating as independent Aboriginal people who are not Victorians? doesn't. The commission and that statute locks you in to that. Yeah. My son, who's completing a PhD on identity right now with the ANU, his wife is up back home here and she's the head of the um, high school here. Um, and uh, what, one of the things that I've been talking to her about and both of them about is the fact that um, you have, we have an opportunity here to develop a, a bi-educational, bi bi-lingual program um, within the school system uh, because there's, you know, 90% are Aboriginal kids in the school. And, um, um, and, and so what we're doing is that I'm saying to them, you've got to get them out of the classroom, walk them on country, teach, let them learn the land, walk them with the elders, yeah? and uh, let the old people explain the different bushes, different structure, different land. Because you see, we have four ecosystems within this defined area. And by walking them through the different ecosystems, they get to understand who their clans are, who their mobs are, because each of the mobs belong to those, those ecosystems. And so then we can relate those kids and their families direct to that ecosystem. So that's where your mob come from. That's where all your totems are. That's where your creation is, yeah? And, um, and then you start teaching them language about what those words are, what, what, uh, what their names are and so on. So we're bringing, bringing in an educational program um, that helps those kids to understand the environment in which they live and from whence they came, yeah? And, and so, like in Sydney, for example, let me, let me just talk to you about Sydney. Yeah, um, I'm about to take uh, uh, people on a journey um, as part of the re-education re into Aboriginal law and culture. And that journey um, is where the, where the creators, what, what my mob, and I'm, I've been through all my ceremonies, and I'm a senior lawman in Western Desert as well, because I've been right across the West Australia in the deserts and did ceremony in Central Australia and South Australia. And so... Um, I'm, I'm part of the peer group who are the senior elders and law people who hold all the stories across this country. Now, in Sydney, um, on this journey I want to take them, um, we're, we're going to go to Byron Bay where we say that the creators turned inland. And Byron Bay in that area is where the, uh, the creator and his two wives sort of camped before they turned inland. They came down the coast, the east coast. And they turned inland. And so we know exactly now all the story places. Right from that place, right into my country. And where they kept going right across the country. And I followed that song line. Yeah. Now, so the educational system would be like, I'm, I'm taking these people up, these are adults and, and their children. Going to Byron Bay and then we're coming all the way down inland through Tenterfield, uh, through Inverell, down to Manila, Tamworth, down to then back down the Barrington Tops and then back right down through Sydney and then down to, um, uh, down to the Shellhaven, which is where my story finishes there because that other mob go a different story and then we come back inland. Now we're going to go along there. There are sites along there and there are there are physical features of the land that people don't know what's there. When they drive past, they've got no idea what they're looking at. And so this is an educational program that has to be and should be introduced to schools, right, at all levels, so that the kids understand the environment in which they live and all the features and structures that exist in that natural landscape so they understand what they're looking at, they understand what's there. And, the, and then you see the relationship between the people and their totem, so whatever's there, if it's a koala bear, <coughs> bat, it doesn't matter. The fact is that within those ecosystems, these people have relationships. 
And so by developing an educational system that takes those kids out there on those type of excur excursions um, and teach them this as including yourselves as university students in education, you know, this is something that's vital. And, um, and that way you're familiarised with the country and understand it more from an Aboriginal perspective. The opportunities to do that has never been made available. And I think, yeah, Taruna, maybe this is a new task for you. Set a new program up. Yeah, well, that's why I've, um, you know, I, I'm sort of lassoed Ellie and sort of say, follow me <laughs> and record all this stuff so that, um, you know, people understand what's really going on. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, a, it's it, 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 yeah, it's, it's very much like what we have now, you know. People truly don't know what's going on. Um, and what for whatever reason is it, you know, basically what they're doing is creating a, you know, in, in Australian society today, you know, um, yeah, they, they, they just, it's like taming the shrew, for example, you know, they're making you all cooperate, and making you all do the things that they want you to do and uh, take away your freedom. And um, yeah, w you know, one of the funny things about, um, about this COVID stuff, where I've talked to a lot of my peers and um, they said, look at all them white fellas, poor fellas locked up and they're telling them what they do and how they can do it and where they can go and all that sort of stuff, who they can mix with, how many people they can have in their houses. And they say, and um, a lot of the old people say, oh, good, now them white fellas can understand what we lived with all our lives. 